The consequences of deciding not to decide. I want to start with a story tonight. I want to tell you the story of a man named Aaron Ralston. He was 27 years old. He was an experienced mountain climber. And he decided to go on a hike in Utah in the Blue John Canyon, late April 2003. It was about a 13-mile trek. It should have taken him about eight hours. But as he was passing through a small passage, a stone shifted, pinning his hand and his forearm. He wasn't able to move. But he had experience. He didn't panic. He got into his backpack and he pulled out some cords and he pulled out some equipment hoping to be able to maneuver and get the stone to move. The stone weighed about a thousand pounds. He was unable to move the stone. He took out his pocket knife and he began to chip away at that stone hoping to get enough room to be able to pull his hand out. But after about ten hours of hard work He had nothing but a little dust to show for his effort. He knew that he was in serious trouble. Day three, he had used up all of his food and water. He knew he was in trouble. Day four, he began to scratch a simple message into the rock that was holding him fast. He scratched the date. He scratched his name. Then in large letters, he scratched R-I-P. Day five. He decided that if he wanted to live, he had to take drastic action. He knew what he had to do. He had known that it was coming to this for several days. And yet he couldn't bear to think about it, much less do it. But now he was ready to take action. He had to amputate his hand. He started by breaking the bone just below his elbow. And then he took his pocket knife and he began to work it through the skin and the tissue and the muscle and through the bone until he had severed his hand. He got into his backpack, he pulled out a medical kit, he bandaged up his arm, made a a, a sling, And now he had to repel 70 feet off of a cliff back down to the ground where he walked out and lived. Aaron Ralston lived because he made a decision. It was a difficult decision. It was a costly decision. But it was the only decision that he could make and live. And he made that decision. Our Lord said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 30, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee for one of thy members to perish, and not thy whole body be cast into hell. Difficult decisions that we have to make in life. Costly decisions. But we have to be willing and ready to make those decisions. I believe that tonight in an audience of this size that there's probably someone here tonight who needs to make that kind of a decision. You see your hand, your forearm, they're pinned underneath a large boulder. We'll call that boulder sin. You've tried to get free, but you haven't yet gotten free from sin. The boulder's too big for you to move on your own. You know that you're going to have to take quick and decisive action, or you're going to die. You're going to die in your sins. You're going to die lost. You're going to die separated from the presence of God. You're going to spend eternity in hell. Maybe no one's ever been that plain with you. Maybe no one's ever been that direct in stating your condition and what you need to do about that condition. But I have found that when people are struggling to make decisions, they don't need wishy-washy preaching. 
They need strong, solid, straightforward direction from the Word of God. Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off and cast it from you. It's profitable for you to do that. Because otherwise you're going to die. Otherwise you're going to lose your life. You're going to lose your soul if you're not willing to make those kinds of choices and decisions. First mission trip I ever took was to Peru, the jungles of Peru. I met some wonderful brethren there. And I met a sister named Rosa. Rosa is a special lady. And while we were there, we celebrated Rosa's birthday. And Rosa is very poor, but Rosa bought some gifts for me to bring home to my girls. So I got close to Rosa. It was a couple of years that passed before I went back and was able to be with those brethren again. And when I was there with those brethren, I looked around and Rosa wasn't there. And so I began to ask them, where's Rosa? They explained that Rosa wasn't faithful anymore. And I asked them if we couldn't set up an appointment and I couldn't go out and I couldn't sit and talk with her and see what was wrong. And so they set up the appointment and we went and talked to Rosa. Whenever I'm overseas, I take pictures of the brethren and I take pictures of the little children and I take pictures of everything that I can so that I can remember being with those brethren. And I had looked through the pictures that I had on my iPad and I had found some pictures of those brethren and I had found some pictures even of Rosa's birthday. And so we went out to see Rosa. I said, Rosa, I want to show you something. And we started flipping through those pictures and she started talking about, look how those children have grown. Look how they've changed. And we got to some pictures and finally we got to pictures of her birthday. She was excited to see those pictures. I wanted to bring back to her memory better times. I wanted to bring back to her memory her family in Christ. I wanted her to miss them and want to be with them again. I said, Rosa, I want to ask you. I want to ask you why you're not faithful in your attendance. Rosa began to explain that she lived a great distance from the building and it was expensive for her to hire a taxi or motor car to take her to the building and that's why she said she wasn't going. And I understood there was some truth in what she was saying. She lives three or four miles from the building. It would be a long walk from her house. And I know that given her financial situation, it's expensive for her to be able to rent a taxi and to go to church services. But I knew those were excuses. And so I said, Rosa, I want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, I want to ask you how far Jesus came seeking you. She knew the answer. He left heaven and came to earth. He came a long way to seek Rosa. I said, I want to ask you another question. How much did Jesus pay in order for you to be saved? She knew the answer. Well, he, he gave everything. He died on the cross. That's right. I said, Rosa, there's nothing that we're ever going to do in our lives that will match up to what our Lord has already done for us. Any distance we travel is less than the distance He traveled. Anything we give or we, that cost us, it's less than what it cost Him. He loved us enough to do that. We've got to love Him enough to do that. I'm glad to say Rosa was restored. She has a good heart. A hard life, but a good heart. And I hope that when I get to go back and be with those brethren again, that Rosa will be there and she'll be faithful to God. Rosa needed someone to be plain with her. And to say, Rosa, here's your situation. and Here's what you need to do. Sometimes we need people to be plain with us. And I want to be plain with you tonight. I want to start with elders tonight. I want to be plain with elders. I know there are a number of elders that are represented in this audience, and I know elders have tremendous responsibility given to them by God. And I know that elders will meet and they'll talk about those that are not attending, and they'll talk about what's, what needs to be said and what needs to be done. And I think that's great that they're doing that, but if that's all they ever do, I'm worried. I'm worried for them. I'm worried for those lost souls because I think they may both perish if that's all they do. 
The Bible says that we are to obey them to have the rule over us. We are to submit ourselves as those that watch for our souls. Because they're going to give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for us. Elders are going to have to give an account. You're going to have to give an account of that sheep that was committed to your care that's now gone astray and whether or not you've gone after them, whether or not you've sent some brethren to try to find them, whether or not you've tried to get them back, whether or not you've been willing to discipline them if it comes to that. That's plain. But they're going to die if you don't do that. And you may very well perish as well. Because God gave you that responsibility. Preacher, let me talk to you for a minute. Preachers, you have a tremendous responsibility to stand and present the Word of God. And preacher, you know that there are members in your congregation that need some strong teaching and preaching. You've seen their Facebook pages. You've seen their pictures. You've seen the movies and books and other things they like. You know something needs to be said. And you know that it's your job to say it. And I'm concerned that if you don't say it, they're going to die. And if you don't say it, then God's going to hold you accountable for not doing your part and trying to bring them back. Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, and he told Timothy to take heed to himself and to the doctrine to continue in them, for in doing this... Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Preacher, you're trying to save yourself as well as those that hear you. Parents, I want to talk to you for a minute. Parents, God's given you a tremendous responsibility. He's placed some precious souls in your care. And they need direction and they need discipline. And if you don't give them that, then they're going to die. And God's going to hold you responsible if you are not doing your part in teaching them. Proverbs chapter 23 and verses 13 and 14 talks about not withholding correction. It talks about using the rod that you might save them from death, that you might save them from hell or the grave. You want your children to go to heaven. I know that you do. But mom and dad, if you're not saying and doing those things you need to do, They're going to die. And they're going to die because of you not doing what God wants you to do. You got teenagers? I got teenagers. I've got good teenagers. But I don't care if you've got good teenagers. They're a challenge. They are a challenge. Because they're gaining their independence. They're moving. They're in a hurry to get there. And there are things that have to be said and there are things that have to be done that are going to sometimes involve a battle. But it's a battle for their souls. It's a battle so they don't die. And so God doesn't one day say to you, I gave you them. It was your job. It was your responsibility. And you blew it. You didn't do it. You didn't do what I told you to do. Serious. Air, alien sinner. That means someone who's not a Christian yet. Let me talk to you for just a minute. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're not baptized, you don't obey the gospel, then you're going to die. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24, if you don't believe, you're going to die in your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38 says, if you're not baptized, your sins have not been remitted. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9 says that Christ is going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and on those who obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God, from the glory of His power. You're going to be separated from God. You're going to be punished. You're going to suffer eternal destruction. You're going to face flaming fire. That's what the Bible says. Erring sinner. Let me talk to you for just a minute. 
you are on the road to death unless you return and you come home. James says in James 5 and verses 9, 19 and 20 that we are to convert these sinners from the error of their way that we might save a soul from death. That's where they're headed. Erring sinner, do you know that your end is going to be worse than the beginning? 2 Peter chapter 2. Do you know that you're going to be beaten with many stripes because you know the truth and you're not doing it? About two months ago, we had a brother in the local congregation in Texas who is unfaithful. And I went and I visited him. We stood in his yard and talked. And he told me he was just going to go back into the world and live the way he used to live. I said, you can't do that. He said, I'm going to. I said, you can't do that. You know the truth. You do that, you're going to be beaten with many stripes. And I didn't know if I got through to him or not. Before I left to come on this trip, I talked to him on the phone. He said, wait, I've been doing some thinking. And he went through some decisions he had made, and they were the wrong decisions, wrong reactions to things. And he said, you know, I've I've been thinking. I don't want to be beaten with many stripes. I thought he was listening. He heard the words of Scripture. He's thinking about that. To my knowledge, he hasn't been restored yet. But I pray that he will. I pray that he's moving in that direction and that he'll realize just how urgent it is that he do something. We're going to go away from us for just a few minutes. We're going to go to the Scriptures and we're going to notice examples of people who had decisions that they had to make. And we're going to see some who made decisions and some who didn't make decisions and we're going to see some who who lived and some who died and some who were blessed and some who were cursed as a result of their decisions or indecision. But I don't want you to get comfortable. I'm just leaving you for a moment. I'm coming back. I'm just building my case. I'm just establishing from all of these examples that men throughout the centuries have had decisions to make and they've made those decisions. And you have a decision to make and you must make your decision tonight. Let's start out in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 19 and 20. Moses is speaking to Israel. And as Moses is speaking to Israel... He says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that thy and thy seed may live. He said, I've set before you life and death. I've set before you blessing and curse. Now you have to choose. He tells them in the next verse, in verse 20, that they should love God and obey God and cleave to God. And then he tells them why. For He is thy life and the length of thy days. You want to live? You better love God, obey God, and cleave to God. Because if you don't, you're going to die. Here's life, here's death. You make the choice. What do you choose? You're going to stay there with a boulder of sin on your hand? Or are you going to do what's necessary to get free that you might live? Moses set that choice before them. Go to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua had already made his choice. He had already made the choice for for himself and for his family. He says, we're serving God. But now it's your turn. You make your choice. It's a personal choice. He says, choose you whom you are going to serve. It is a pressing choice. He says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But it also was a painful choice because he talked about the gods whom their fathers had served. They were going away from the gods 
that mom and dad had worshipped. They were going to have to worship Jehovah God, leaving those other gods that weren't really gods, leaving them behind. That was a painful choice, but that was the choice that they had to make. They had to be willing to, to, to cut away that past. They had to be willing to give that up in order to choose and obey God. Go to 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. Here we're in the days of Elijah. And Elijah comes to his people and he says, How long halt ye between two opinions? If Jehovah be God, then follow Him. If Baal be God, then follow Him. And the people answered him not a word. Here were people that were trapped by sin. Here were people that were going back and forth between Baal and God. Here were people that were going back and forth between life and death. Have you ever seen a squirrel run out into the road? Runs out into the road and then he realizes you're coming and he thinks, I need to get out of here. And so he starts off, but then he can't decide and so he comes back and what happens? You run over him. Why did you run over him? Because he couldn't make a decision. You know, a lot of us are spiritual squirrels. We know what we need to do. We see the danger coming. We know judgment's coming. We know death is going to happen. We know we're not ready. We run out and we say, oh no. We run back and before we know it, we're dead and we're gone and we're lost. Because we didn't make the decision that we knew we should have made. That's what they were doing. They answered not a word. You know why they didn't answer? Because they didn't have an answer. Because they knew they should be serving God. They knew Baal was wrong. But they knew that if they left Baal and served God, there would be consequences. They knew there would be persecution. You remember a woman named Jezebel? She was ruthless. They were going to face Jezebel. And they were more afraid of facing Jezebel than they were facing God. And that's foolish. Because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But go with me to another example. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 18. And verse 31. Ezekiel 18 and verse 31. Ezekiel says, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel says, get rid of your sins. Cast them away from you. You remember what Jesus said, Matthew 5 and verse 30? Your hand offends you, cut it off, cast it from you. That's what Ezekiel's saying. Here are your sins, get rid of them, cast them away. And then he says, oh, why will you die? Don't you realize you're going to die? Why are you choosing to die instead of living? It doesn't make sense. He'll say the same thing in chapter 33 and verse 11. Jeremiah is going to say it as well in Jeremiah chapter 27. And I, I just picture Jeremiah. You know Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. And you know how much he loved his people. Jeremiah 9 and verse 1 says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes were a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. That's the way He loved them. And can't you just hear Jeremiah crying? Can't you just hear the trembling in his voice? Can't you just hear him saying, Why are you dying? Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Then why? Why is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? Well, because they won't take the medicine. They won't come to the doctor. That's why they're dying. Jeremiah was bringing the message from God. That's what a prophet does. They had taken that medicine, done what Jeremiah said, they could have lived. But they were that squirrel running in and out of the world road until they perished. 
Don't be like that. Don't make those decisions. But I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7, in verses 3 through 5. It's the story of four lepers. And these four lepers say, Why sit we here until we die? Let me give you some background. The city had been besieged, surrounded. All supplies had been cut off. And they had exhausted what resources they had within the city. In fact, you go back one chapter and you'll find just how desperate it was. They were paying exorbitant prices for things that weren't even food. They were paying huge prices for doves dung. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound good. I wouldn't give you a penny for it. But they were paying huge prices for it because they were starving to death. You know what two of the mothers in this city did? They made an agreement. Today we eat your son, tomorrow you eat mine. And after they had sacrificed the first child, then the mother that still had the living child went and hid her child. They're complaining. How bad does it have to be for people to turn to those kinds of things? That's the background of this. These lepers, think about the position they're in. They're outside the city, but they're dependent on people from the city to bring them something. And there's nothing coming out of the city. And so they're sitting there and they know that they're dying. And so they have to make a decision. And they have three decisions. All of them are bad. At least on the surface they are. The first decision is we go into the city and die. The second decision choice is we sit here and we die. And you know what the best choice is? We go over to the enemy and hopefully they won't kill us. They may capture us, they may kill us, but what's the worst that can happen? We die. We're going to die here, we're going to die there. We might as well go over there and let the enemy get it over with. Let's go. And so at twilight, they go over to the coast of the uh, the host of the Syrians. When they get there, they're surprised. Because the, 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 the Syrians have fled, leaving everything behind. The Syrians had heard the noise of a great army coming. You know who who it was? Four lepers. God made four lepers sound like all the chariots of Egypt. And so the Syrians said, we're out of here. And they left everything behind. And so these lepers start walking in the tents and they were sitting there and dying and now they're sitting here and feasting. They eat and they eat and they eat and they carry out the silver and the gold and the spoil and they hide it and they come back and they do it again and they repeat this process over and over again. Can you imagine the joy of those four lepers when they realized that because of the decision they made, they were going to live. Okay, we're back to you. What decision are you going to make? Decision you make is going to determine whether you live or you die. I want you to know there's bread in my Father's house and despair. Luke chapter 15. I want you to know that there is wealth untold. But you have to make the decision. It's a pressing decision, it's a painful decision, but it's your decision and you have to make it. You're the one with a boulder of sin on your hand. You're the only one there. You're the only one that can make the choice that I'm going to pay whatever I have to pay. I'm going to make whatever sacrifice I have to make. I'm going to walk away from this and I'm going to be with God. I'm going to live. I want you to know you can't just think about it. Judges chapter 5 and verse 15, we read of some in Reuben. It's in the days of Deborah and Barak, and it said in Reuben there were great thoughts of heart. The very next verse says there were great searchings of heart. Reuben was really thinking about it, but you know what Reuben did? Nothing. 
They thought about it, but they didn't do anything. That may be you tonight, thinking about it but not doing anything. Let me tell you about another man. Acts 24 and verse 25, his name was Felix. And Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And this man trembled. And he said, go your way. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Can you tell me where that call ever came? Can you point to book, chapter, and verse where he said, Paul, I'm ready. Paul, come baptize me. I don't have a record of that. For as I know, that never happened. Here's a man who heard the gospel preached by one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, and he's trembled. He's shaking in the presence. He knows judgment's coming. He knows he's not ready. He knows what righteousness that God demands, and he knows he doesn't measure up. But he doesn't do anything. He won't sever that hand that he might live. My question tonight is, were you willing to do that? Will you make that choice? Or will you die waiting for something that's never going to come, never going to happen? I'm an English major, and one of the books that we had to read when I was in school was by Stephen Crane. It's called The Open Boat. Stephen Crane had an odd view of the world. He wanted to show how unfair the world was to those that live in this world, and so he told about a ship that goes down at sea, and four men get onto a little boat, and they start rowing. And they row for day after day, Finally, they get in sight of the shore. Oh, they're, they're so excited. They're, they're, they're tired. Their, their arms are aching. They didn't think they would ever see land again. And now they are in sight of the shore. And as they get closer and closer to the shore, a wave turns their little boat over and they're thrown out into the sea. Their arms are tired. The water's cold. Three of the men wash up safely on shore. But one of the men, the strongest of them all, he died in sight of the shore. Crane was wanting to make a point about how unfair that is. But I'm here to tell you tonight that there will be people who will die in sight of the shore. They will die just that close to salvation. They will die because they won't make the difficult decision that has to be made in this very moment that we have been given. If you're not a Christian tonight, I'm going to be plain with you. If you die tonight, you're going to die in your sins. You're going to die lost. You're going to die separated from God. You're going to die without hope of eternal life. But like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and other great men of the past, we're asking, why would you make that choice? Life is here. Life and death are set before you. Blessing and cursing are here. Just choose life. Don't sit there and die. Get up and go. There's bread. There's wealth untold. But you have to get up and go. If you're a child of God tonight and you've not been faithful to God... I want to be plain with you. If you die tonight in your condition as it is right now, you're going to die lost. Judgment is going to be extremely hard for you because you've turned your back on the Lord that you knew. And one time, 
said you would always be faithful to Him. He's your judge. And He has said, He that rejecteth Me and receiveth not My words has one that judge, judges Him. He's going to judge you. He's going to judge you not as someone who never knew the Gospel, but as someone who knew it and turned away from it. It's hard for me to imagine hell being any worse than the description the Bible gives me of it. The one separation that I see is many stripes. If it can be possibly any worse for anyone, it is for you. Because you knew and did nothing about it. If you need to come tonight, come as we stand and as we sing.